Hello, everybody, and welcome to the IndoSoft webinar Stamp the Expert on December 27, 2017. My name is Fabio Terezinho. I'll be your host today. And as probably you know, the agenda for this webinar is quite different from any other webinar. It is an open agenda. So my goal here will be to answer uh, your questions. Uh, so feel free to write them on the status bar from, uh, from the WebEx bar on the top of your monitor. You can use the chat box or the Q&A box, and I'll be reading your questions and answering them one by one uh, until you have no more questions or uh, when we get to the top of the hour, whatever happens first. So before we go through the questions, just want to take the one moment here to thank each one of you uh, not only for joining this webinar, but especially for your commitment and your partnership throughout the year. 2017 was the best year in the IndoSoft history. Um, we grew like never before, and it was thanks to you and your partnership and your commitment to our solution. And we have reinvested this, uh, th this growth into the business hiring new engineers, new support engineers, uh, developers, so you can continue evolving the product faster than ever and continue providing technical support, even free of charge, uh, as we have been doing for years, and provide uh, ever uh, better experience to our partners and our customers uh, like yourself. So again, thank you very much. Our success is your success as well. And we look forward to a 2018 even more successful than 2017. So thank you very much for your support this year. With that, uh, I'll start reading the questions here. Let's see. Okay, so first question. Is there a way where I can see IoT View screen as the only thing on my Raspberry Pi Chromium browser? What I mean is without Chromium header or IoT View navigation header. I'm using a seven inch screen and the web browser header and the bar used to log on, log off occupy almost 30%. Okay, so yes, the, the answer is yes. We have customers that ha have done it uh, and have been using IoT View. And IoT View, in, in case somebody else here has not heard of it, IoT View is the runtime edition of IndoSoft Web Studio for Linux and VxWorks. So it, you can run it uh, on devices like a Raspberry Pi running Linux, uh, for example. Uh, IoT View does not provide yet a native viewer. Uh, it is in our roadmap for 2018, uh, but it's a, a server for remote thin clients, SMA thin clients based on HTML5. Because in most applications where IoT View is used today, it runs in a black box like a Raspberry Pi, and the graphical interface is a remote station like an iPad, an iPhone, an Android uh, tablet or phone, a uh, remote browser, uh, where the user uses a, a regular web browser to access the application. But we've had some customers that use IoT View as a local HMI, and they want to visualize the screens locally on, on the same device where, the, uh, where IoT View is running. So that's common that in those cases, they want to have a local web browser uh, working in kiosk mode. So for the, the, the customers that I got contact with, they, they use different web browsers, but in a quick research about uh, Chromium, uh, Chromium, you should be a, able to use this command line uh, with Chromium browser, space, dash, dash, kiosk, space, and then the URL to open the uh, SMA Thin Client page. So using this special uh, attribute here, dash, dash, kiosk, you should be able to open Chromium in a kiosk mode, taking the full screen and hiding automatically the uh, the header from the web browser. And hopefully it's gonna work on, on your case. Uh, but like I said, uh, we have customers using web browsers on Linux, uh, taking full screen 
and they have sold uh, real wage amounts, real projects in this mode. So the second question, uh, sometimes when editing graphic objects on one screen, I resize one to certain size uh, and then go to the next screen, and when I touch one object, it acquires the same size of the forecoming. Uh, also, this action is undoable. Uh, there, there are a few other comments here. I'll just try to scroll the bar. Uh, would you please help me understand why this is so? I would like to use this characteristic if possible, but I do not know how to reproduce the experience on purpose. It just happens randomly. Sure. So this is the development environment of Windowsoft Web Studio. I will create two screens here on the editor so I can demonstrate how you can control this behavior. So I will create an object uh, on this screen let's say a large rectangle here, and on screen four, I will create a small rectangle. And I can switch back and forth, and as you see here, each one of the objects keeps their original size. Now, if I double click on the object, uh, on the editor, it uh, allows me to select here the format tab uh, on the ribbon interface. And even if the Format tab is open, I can switch back and forth and the objects keep their original size. However, in the Format tab, I have the size fields for width and height. So if I put the cursor on either the width or the height fields on the ribbon interface, like for instance right now the width is in focus, when this particular field is in focus, and I switch to another screen where I have an object selected, the width here is automatically applied to the object in the other screen, just like I did now. So again, if I go back to screen four, screen five, if the object is not selected, like for instance, screen five, the object is not selected, then I can go to format, select height, and it's not going to apply the height to the object in screen 5. However, if I select the object in screen 5, and then in format, leave the cursor on the height field, when I go to screen 5, now it applies that height to the selected object. So to answer your question, in order to apply uh, the, the size from the object in one screen, to the object in the other screen, the object must be selected and you must have the focus on the width or height fields of the ribbon when you switch to the other screen. Hopefully this will uh, uh, describe to you clearly how you can control the behavior of applying the, the width, or, uh, width or height of an object in one screen two objects in another screen when you select the different screen on the development environment. Uh, another question is, uh, when editing an object, the program freezes and shuts down. If working on a screen, the name of it changes. For instance, uh, P3PAPI to P3PAPI SC underscore. So next time I start the program, the software will not see it. I found out that by simple pro the simple procedure of modifying the name of the original, replacing the underscore with a C, it would work again. But uh, I'm affecting other things I do not explain. Uh, please explain. So uh, I'm, this is not, uh, at least in the latest version of Indusoft, we are not aware of any behavior that would make the program freeze and shut down. But if this happens, for, first of all, if you can reproduce it somehow systematically, uh, please send an email to support at Indusoft.com with the steps that you have to, reproduce, to follow to reproduce the problem. If the problem does not happen systematically, what I would ask you to do is come here to Project, 
preferences and check those four check boxes under quality feedback services. Then when the problem happens again, if the problem happens again, please check if there is any file in the web dump subfolder of the application and send those files to us along with your application. It may help us to understand uh, what caused the problem, uh, and then if it is a bug in the product, uh, modify this to, to avoid the behavior. Uh, but so far, that, that's the first time that we have a report about this particular issue, and we should be able to capture if you simulate the problem again with those options enabled. Uh, so let's see more questions. Huh. Nice Christmas to your, you all, all as well. Uh, very good. So some thanks. Great. Sounds like uh, it answered the questions. Uh, yeah, and one feedback that when it happens, the dump files are huge, uh, like 500 megabytes, and that's very possible because it brings all the stacks, all, all the information we need to pinpoint what happened. So in those cases, what we need is you, for you to upload the file to a FTP site. There are some free FTP sites uh, available out there, and send us the link to download the file from that FTP site. Uh, another alternative is to burn the files in a DVD or USB, something like that, and mail it to us. But usually customers just upload it to a free uh, storage, something like Box, Google Drive, something like that, and provide us the link uh, to download the files. Uh, after we download the files, then you can release them from your uh, web storage. So another question here, uh, what common mistakes should we avoid when setting up applications? Uh, great question, uh, also very generic as well. So uh, one thing that's uh, quite common on, on applications that could help you to uh, minimize the, make the efforts to create and evolve the applications is to put some planning into the project before you start the project and usually it starts on the tags definition. So in the soft, you can create a flat database uh, just creating tags like uh, I have here, pressure, level, motor, and so on. Or you can create a structured database using classes, for example. So let's say if you know that in your application you're gonna have some PID uh, loops, like 12 PID loops, and every single PID loop has set point, PV, MV, KP, KI, KD, instead of creating all those tags manually here, you can right click on classes, create a class, for instance, CPID. I like to use the C prefix to classes names, uh, but it's not mandatory. And then you create your members, like set point, PV, MV, KP, KI, KD, and they could be from different types, could have a name, that's a string, whatever it is. So the class is not a tag, it's just the definition of a tag. In this case, I have the class CPID with seven members. Then when you create the tag like PID, it can be from the class CPID, and if I have several PID loops, I can create an array, for example. So for instance, I can create an array of 10 PID tags, each one of them with seven members, and the first one is PID index zero, and the last one is PID index 10. So I just created 11 instances of the tag PID, each one of them with seven members. So in one row of the tags database, I just created 77 tags. Several advantages. First, time to create the tags. It's much faster to do what I did here once than creating all those 77 tags manually. Second, during the runtime, you can use indirect tags and a tag as the, the index of the array or linked symbols with, uh, with the class tag to minimize work when designing screens and writing scripts as well. 
Uh, also, in the future, if you want to create a new PID loops, you just increase the number of arrays. Uh, if you want to create new members to the PIDs, you just create a new member to the class once. And it enforces consistency across the whole project. And each one of those uh, tags uh, are still holding an individual value. For example, I can use PID index 5 dot set point. This is the set point for the PID number 5. I can have PID index 6 dot set point. It's a different value. I can have 10 here and 20 here, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> this is just one of uh, so many tricks and, and tips that we can provide for creating a new application. But in general, it all comes to uh, plan your project before you start it. So usually you can create the structure that will help you minimize rework in the future. Plus, if you go to the Indusoft website, indusoft.com, and you reach here, uh, Partners, System Integrators, we have these best practices for system integrators. It's pretty much a manual uh, with several tips and tricks to help you build applications within the software studio in the most efficient way. So it's a longer way to answer your question. Very well. So let's go to the next questions. See, I'll try to reproduce. Great, thanks for the feedback. Another one here. <coughs> okay. So, hi Fabio, hello. I have a question to trend control module. We have run time config used in advanced tab. It's working only on the server. On thin client, display IS symbol error and doesn't work at all. Uh, how to fix it on thin client? Or maybe a backdoor way to get this functionality. So very well, let's go here to the graphics. And I, as far as understood, you're using the trained control. And we have a runtime config in advanced tabs. So if you go here to advanced, you have here the runtime config to save and retrieve uh, information during the thin client. This option here where you can save configuration, load configuration uh, during the runtime on the thin client is by design disabled on the thin client. If you go to the help manual, uh, we explain that this, um, the run mode options is available only on the server, not on the thin client. The thin clients can load uh, uh, saved profiles, but the thin client cannot actually save the, the load profiles. So what about a workaround? So virtually any uh, characteristic of the trend control can be configured during the runtime. Even if you go here in points, all those options here can be configured during the runtime. You have the, the options field here and you can use tags for different options here. You also have, uh, even for the labels, for the tag fields, you can use different uh, tags. And even the style can be changed during the runtime. So we created a sample application. If I go here to indosoft.com under sample applications, let me just close here. If you search for trained, there is, let's see, add custom pen, trained annotation, trained profile. There you go. This application, trained profile, this example shows you how you can change the configuration, how you can create profiles, even. Uh, from thin clients during the runtime. So I just download this application quickly here. Trained profile. I will copy it under my documents in the soft projects. 
So I have here trained profile. Now I'm going to open this application with Indusoft Web Studio. So just drag here to open this project in the Software Studio. Let's verify it. Just to save all the screens uh, in the format of in the Software Studio 8.1. There we go. And now I can run it. So if I go here to the main screen, I can cr I can add pens, for example. Uh, let me add a pen for the tag second, for example, and I can write a label second tag, okay, and I can select colors, like for instance, this color, weight, expansion, type of line, whatever it is, minimum and maximum, and I have the value there. And I can save this profile as, for instance, click here in Save, Profile Name, uh, First Profile. And I can even give an access level if I want to protect from different users. So I have this profile here. Now I'm going to modify this profile. I'm going to change the color to orange. I'm going to add a second pin for the tag Minutes. Minutes tag, for example. And for the minutes tag, I want to show a different color. I want to have dashed lines. I want to be thicker and apply. So I have those two pens now. And I want to save this one as, uh, let's save as second profile. And save it. Now I can come here to load, are you sure? And I can load the first profile or I can load the second profile with the two pens. So using this example, and this works from thin clients as well, uh, you can uh, apply the profiles, create your own profiles, and load profiles during the runtime. And here in history, I even have a, a history of all the changes made by different users when they make, made the changes, what changes they made. And if you come here, to the actual uh, application, you see all these screens that I created, and they are generic screens. You could use them in your uh, regular object, in your regular trains. Uh, and here, the tags I use, for instance, in points for each one of the pens. And the main one is this styler modifier. Here is where I use tags to control the color, the type of pen, the weight, all the, the settings that you have for a pen. So using this template that's available to download free of charge from the website, you can uh, create your trained screens and create your profiles and modify the profiles even from a thin client, uh, web thin client or SMA thin client. So hopefully this addresses the, the question you posted here. Okay, let's see if there are other questions. Some positive feedback, thank you. Okay, question, when uh, using IoT View, how long can I go with update rates for process values? I have no alarms, no trains, I have close to 40 tags, but most of the values are transferred uh, with MQTT since IoT View does not have TCP IP as of now. Uh, that's an interesting case, by the way, and let's talk here about the uh, IoT View update rate. So if, I go, if we come here to Think Clients Mobile Access, and I assume that's what you're talking about, process values updates, under Global Settings, we have this process value update settings, which by default is 1,000 milliseconds, so uh, one second. I can change it to 100 milliseconds to more or less than that, but typically the lowest uh, I keep here is, 1, 000, is 100 milliseconds, uh, and this is how fast values changing on the server will be sent to the thin client. 
So it does not update how fast uh, we are reading data via MQTT or via OPC or via uh, a browser or, or via a driver. This is only how fast the server updates thin clients after the values change on the server. Uh, usually there is a trade-off. The, 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 the lower the, this number, uh, the faster the, the thin clients are updated, uh, but also the higher the traffic in the network. And since the thin clients are usually uh, just to display information to the, to the operator, to the human being, and the human being cannot react faster than 100 milliseconds anyway, I usually recommend not to use this uh, setting here with anything less than 100 milliseconds. Uh, but I have several applications using 100 milliseconds and update the thin clients as fast as that, 10 times per second. Now, this is only the update between the IoT View runtime server and the thin clients. What about if you want to exchange data between IoT View on the Linux box and Indo Software Studio, for instance, in uh, uh, another runtime in the Software Studio in a Windows box? Then this setting does not affect it at all. And today, we have different ways uh, you are correct, the TCP IP server module is not available on IoT View, but there are different modules that are available and allows you to exchange data between IoT View on Linux and Indo Software Studio on a runtime station. So just to show some of the methods that are possible. So I'll create here uh, very quickly a slide here. So let me just delete all those elements. There you go. So let's say you have here IoT View runtime, and you have a PC here running in the Software Studio runtime, and you want to exchange data between them, right? Uh, again, just to, to make it clear, the thin client process value just affects SMA thin clients connected to the IoT View runtime. So this setting here under graphics, mobile access, global settings, process values, that's how fast an IoT View runtime will update values on SMA thin clients connected to it. Now, what if you want to exchange data between IoT View Runtime and Indo Software Studio Runtime running on a PC? There are different ways to make it work, but the one that I recommend today is to enable here on IoT View Runtime an OPC UA server, which is built in in IoT View now, uh, in version 8.1. All you have to do here in tasks is to set the OPC UA server to automatic, and then when you run, download the application to the Linux box, when you run it, the OPC UA server will automatically run, and on the tags, you can define uh, which tags should be exposed by this OPC UA server for read-write or read-only. And then on the PC, you can use an OPC UA client. The OPC UA client module that we have for a long time in, in the Software Studio. So just link it to the OPC UA server running with IoT View, and they will exchange data with each other by subscription during the runtime. You could invert that as well. You could have the on IoT View running the OPC UA client and have the PC running the OPC UA server. Doesn't matter, either way works, but typically assuming that IoT View will be the source of the information, will be the one actually communicating with the, the controllers, with the sensors, it would make more sense to have the OPC UA server running on IoT View. But either way works. You can, as long as you run the UA client in one module, in one station, and the UA server in the other station. And both the OPC UA client and OPC UA server are natively available in the Software Studio, including IoT View, 
since version 8.1. And this link here will be over any TCP IP link. So it's equivalent to the TCP IP client server native modules from Windows Soft App Studio. This is one option, uh, and that's the option I would recommend. But just so you know, other options would be you could use the MoTCP driver on IoT View, which is, implements the Modbus TCP slave protocol, and the Mod SL driver on the PC, which implements the Modbus slave protocol. And over TCP IP, the Modbus master can be writing or reading data from the Modbus slave during the runtime. Obviously, when you use OPC, you can use subscription, so values uh, are exchanged only when they change, which is more efficient. When you use Modbus, Modbus is a pooling protocol, so the master will be pooling <coughs> data from the slave and writing data to the slave if you configure to do so. One last option that you could use as well is to use the MQTT driver on both ends, MQTT, sorry, MQTT. But then you have to use an external component. I use even a different color because this is not part of Windows Soft Web Studio as an MQTT broker. And then IoT View can be a publisher and or subscriber saving data to this broker, sending and receiving data from the broker. And so does Windows Soft Web Studio through the MQTT driver. And both links would be using TCP IP. So here you have at least three different methods to control the communication, to enable the communication uh, between IoT View Runtime and Indus Software Studio Runtime on the PC. And again, OPC is based on subscription, but when you configure a connection on the OPC client, you define here uh, the endpoint, the, uh, you define a connection name here, whatever it is, you have some advanced uh, settings as well. Let's say OK. And then you can create an OPC client worksheet. And here you define the publish rate. So when values change on the server, uh, how fast the server should be uh, updating the client if the values change on the server. So you can define this publish rate here to whatever value you want, 100 milliseconds, 1,000 milliseconds, whatever it is. And via Modbus, when you use Modbus, then you control the Modbus TCP how fast you want to pull data. If you use the option enable read when idle, it is as fast as possible. If you use read trigger, then it's as fast as the tag in the read trigger changes of value. And MQTT is all immediate based on subscription and uh, subscription and publishing. So hopefully it addresses uh, your question there. Yeah, good feedback. You're using 500 milliseconds and it's doing great. So excellent. So you are optimizing the the network and no need to to decrease even more the period there. Uh, what would be the best approach? I bet there are many in Web Studio to convert counts. Uh, to flow rate, for example, gallon per minute, uh, for example. Thank you. You are absolutely right. There, there are so many ways to, to convert counts into uh, instantaneous uh, rate. Now, the, the key question is how fast do you want to, to do this calculation? Do you want to do every time that the count increments, or you want to add for one minute and then provide the, the calculations for one minute. So either way, I would recommend using the scheduler module. <clears throat> so for example, let's say that you have here in the scheduler module, uh, you define here that every time that the tag minute changes, so every minute, you take uh, counter new, Let's create a tag counter new, and you have your actual tag counter. So whatever is the counter that you're receiving from the field goes to this tag counter new. Or let's even do better. Every minute, I'm going to 
create a tag here, run script. I'll set this tag to one. So every minute I'm going to set this tag run script to one. And here in scripts, I'm going to say here calculate flow. And in the execution, I will have the tag run script. And after I do everything I want, I will set run script to zero. So every one minute, this tag goes to one, and I execute this script once. Many ways to do that, but one thing we can do is counter new is equal to counter, assuming that counter is the actual tag you're reading from the sensor, from the PLC, whatever it is. And after you do everything, you make counter previous is equal to counter new. And now here, let's say that you have the gallon per minute is equal to counter new minus counter previous. And that's it. So every minute you take the counter to the counter new. The gallon per minute is pretty much one minus the other, usually times a constant. If each counter means, for instance, 50 gallons, then it's time 50. The number of uh, pulses you, you had in this limit times 50. That's going to be your gallons per minute for that minute. And you write counter new to the counter previous, so in the next uh, interaction, you, you already know the, the difference there. That's at least one way of doing that. Another way of doing that, which is instantaneous, which is way less common, but let's say it, it's running continuously, and I can have here, uh, a ver let's create a counter previous. So if counter previous, is different from counter. In other words, if counter changes, then, and only then, then you do this. At the end, you make counter previous, counter previous equals to counter. At the end of the, the uh, execution here. But what you want to do is you want to find the time difference between the previous and the new. So let's create two, just to make the, the script easier to read, I'll create TS previous and TS. TS, TS previous is going to be counter previous dash great timestamp. So any tag has a field called timestamp. If I use here second timestamp, it returns the last date and time when this tag last changed of, of value. But I want to remove the milliseconds, the dot zero, 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 whatever it is. So to remove the milliseconds, I'm going to use this function str get element. From this source, use dot as the delimiter and return the first portion of the string. What this function is doing is returning everything before the dot. So only the date and time without milliseconds. The TS, the timestamp, is going to be almost the same thing. But I'm going to use the tag counter. Now I want to know the TS the difference in seconds between both dates. So there is an easy function in VBScript called date diff. You define the interval, so I want in seconds. Uh, and I want to know the difference between TS previous and TS. So it's going to tell you how many seconds elapsed between the current counter and the previous counter. And now you can easily do the math, right? So gallon per minute, for example, if you have this tag, is going to be a constant divided, whatever constant it is, divided by this time. 
and that's it. So you always have the instant gallon per minute uh, every time that you get a new counter. And the longer it took you to, to get the counter, the lower is going to be your gallon per minute. So those are the two main methods, either instantaneous, instantaneous or you can have uh, for, uh, granulated on a period of, of time, per period of time. It doesn't need to be one minute. It can be every 10 seconds, but the difference is you multiply by the constant, and if, if it is every 10 seconds, divide it by 6, because that's the number of uh, pulses you expect in 60 seconds, for example. So either way, you can either calculate the instantaneous value or you can aggregate after a period of time. Very good. Excellent. Good. You are welcome. Uh, so, more questions here? Talking about? Great. Please let me know if OPC UA server can use integer reals string binary because uh, MQTT only handles strings. Yes, OPC UA server supports all the data types from in the software studio, string, integers, real strings, including class tags as well. <coughs> Do you have webinars on OPC UA recorded previously or documents to learn about it? Yes, we have both. Uh, if you go to help, in our help, we talk about the OPC UA uh, modules. Uh, both OPC UA and uh, client and OPC UA server. If I come here, OPC UA, then you have here a list of status, uh, OPC client, different topics about the OPC client, and OPC server, these different topics about the OPC server as well. So that's the documentation. Also, if you Google, for Indosoft Webinar OPC UA, then there are different uh, webinars here that talk about uh, OPC, both the client and the server as well. And you can just watch those uh, webinar videos at your own pace. Question, I set up security on IoT View. Now I can enter on every level defined uh, when running. I can also edit, but when I want to modify values on database pi, uh, I would not let me. Why, how can I solve it? Database pi is not available on IoT View yet. Uh, it would, according to our roadmap, uh, database Pi will be available for IoT View on Q1 of 2018. So by the time that we release Service Pack 1, which is going to be April 3rd, 2018, as a target date, you'll be able to use the standard remote database Pi here. To uh, ju just type the IP address of the Linux box, and then you'll be able to monitor tag values, write tag values, even execute functions from the remote database by. If your question is about the development environment, then in order to enable or disable access to the database by, you have this option here, enable remote system and remote uh, troubleshooting tools, uh, and you have this option database by write, that for any group you can enable or disable. But those, uh, again, database Pi as a whole is available today for Windows runtimes only. It will be available for IoT View runtime on Linux uh, according to our plan by the end of Q1. Very good. Some positive feedback. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Another question here. When using a .NET active object, if I'm waiting for the object to respond, does this pause all other processes within the application? I was told there is only one available thread for such communications. Yes and no. Actually, there is a thread for communication with the server 
and there is a thread for everything else, including uh, screen updates. Uh, what we mean that there is just one, just one thread is uh, there is just one thread to update the graphical object. So if that thread is paused, uh, you could be communicating with the server in, uh, in the background, but you'll not be able to see that because the thread that actually updates the values on the screens uh, is frozen. Now, when you say that you are waiting for this object to, de to respond, it really depends how you are waiting for this object to respond. If you are using the wait built-in function in a graphics script, for example, so if you come here to graphics script and while running, you use the wait built-in function and say, okay, wait two seconds, whatever it is, then while you are waiting for this period of time, all the, the graphical interface is frozen. We are literally not updating anything uh, during that period of time. But if the wait is a, is a code running inside the .NET control, then it's not uh, preventing Indosoft from updating the screen whatsoever. And if you have an event on the .NET control that is triggered when uh, whatever action it is that the dot .NET control is doing finishes, then you can have a script in the event tab of the .NET control to treat whatever you have to treat when the, the, the task is finished. Okay? So hopefully th this addresses uh, your question there about .NET controls on the thin client. Good, so soaked it, great, appreciate the feedback. So, so far we went through uh, the questions here. Excellent, no more, oh, there you go, a few others. Uh, it's not a built-in function, but acts more like a ping, waiting for a response from the device on the network, in this case, uh, to get its video. Right, but as long as this ping is executed inside the .NET control, it should not at all freeze the, the screen while you are waiting for the feedback. And if you are the one creating the .NET control, I would strongly recommend to create an event uh, that lets Indosoft know when the ping finished uh, so you can treat this feedback accordingly. Excellent. So, looks like we went through all the questions. I'll give a few more seconds in case someone else has something else to to write, either on the chat box or on the Q&A box. Doesn't look like we received additional questions. So, with that, I would like to just once again uh, saying a great, great uh, thank you to each one of you for using the products, for uh, joining this webinar today, for posting your questions. Uh, I'm really satisfied with the results this year and very grateful for your partnership, for uh, you being customers and partners of Indosoft this year, and really look forward to an even better uh, 2018 to all of us. So have a great holiday season, everybody, and Look forward to working with you next year. Thank you and have a great day.